This talk is intended as an investigation in line with the broader aims of the Skyscraper Museum's goal of reopening the question of where and how one of the great machines of the late 19th century, the modern office building, originated. My own dissertation, completed in 1975 under Jim O'Gorman, began when the historical narrative of modern construction and design still ran through Chicago with the principal purpose to provide a foundation for all that mattered, European modern. The tragedy of the Beaux-Arts Chicago Fair undercutting American modernism in the persons of Sullivan and Wright was a high point in the then tragic story of American architecture. My research since then, particularly looking at Frank Furness, but also his pupil, William Price, and now finally, Joseph Wilson, suggests that the origins are broader than usually stated and the inherent cultural biases and goals are only now being properly considered. <clears throat> the standard narrative of modern architecture begins with Richard, Richardson's Mod Marshall Field Warehouse, whose mass and simplification caused Sullivan to get rid of his fussy Victorianism while passing on the urgency of contemporary life and building systems to his pupil, Frank Lloyd Wright. This in turn led to Gropius. The first question is how and why that connection was made and why it was necessary. In large measure, <clears throat> the purpose of the story was to link Gropius to the American modern by connecting him to Chicago technology. But this story left out two other major players in the narrative, the skyscrapers about identity in New York, and as we shall see, earlier engineering innovations that had occurred in Philadelphia. The European-centric narrative of high modern begins with the glass and iron crystal palace, leading to such modern structures as Barron's AEG plant, and again onto Gropius and the Bauhaus. In this narrative, Gropius takes credit for conceiving an architecture adapted to our world of machines, radios, and fast cars. The problem, of course, was that Gropius's markers, machines, radios, and fast cars, represented elite European culture, but were widespread across all tiers of the United States. Indeed, Americans had adopted machines as part of life half a century and more earlier. An example of how the two cultures diverged can be seen in the production of automobiles. <clears throat> in Europe, cars were status markers made for the few. In the United States, while there was an elite custom car market, there was also a mass market shaped by Henry Ford that drove, drove car prices down so the typical American family could afford a car. American production for a smaller population was nearly 20 times that of all of Europe, and American cars cost one-tenth of, of the price of a mid-priced European car. To explain the different strategies between Europe and the United States, Lewis Mumford, writing in 1929 for an optimistically titled set of architectural plates, American architecture of the 20th century, concluded that in Europe, modern was, quote, an elite program, a theoretical frame, while in the United States, modern came from, quote, a straightforward facing of the problem of function, with the conclusion that Americans were, quote, modern in spite of themselves. The competition for the Chicago Tribune became a focal point of the conflict. This was evident both in what was praised in the Hitchcock story, the Euro design should have won even though only Loos understood the American strategy with his humorous take on the classical base shaft capital column models of early skyscrapers. The American winner, <clears throat> Raymond Hood's Gothic accented shaft that proclaimed the free press as a beacon of truth and civilization was left out of standard American histories. Facts were irrelevant. Euro austerity won over American identity. When I was in graduate school, the 1920s New York skyscrapers and their imitators across the nation were seen as garish, lowbrow designs because of their ornament and color. Fortunately, I had Jim O'Gorman as my advisor and mentor as we worked on the Frank Furness exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum. Our colleague, the brilliant photographer, Servan Robinson, was working on his visual masterpiece, Skyscraper Style, that soon made clear the stunning power of the great 1920s New York buildings. In 1969, 
I had purchased at auction the photographic archive of Frank Furness pupil, William Price. Initially, looking at Hitchcock's Pelican history series on 19th and 20th century architecture, Price seemed an interesting but minor, minor figure, not heading toward the modern that mattered. In the summer of 1972, I went to Atlantic City and saw his Tramor and Bunham hotels, and I was hooked and immediately saw his connection to the New York architecture that Servin was photographing. I suggested Price as my dissertation to O'Gorman, who agreed. The Tramor was an icon of the global resort of Atlantic City. In construction, it was an extraordinary tour de force built in less than nine months towering 17 stories to its crowning domed ballrooms. The Tramor was the star of an exhibit of an American architecture that toured Europe after World War I and clearly influenced the shape of the American tall building of the 1920s, <clears throat> much of what we think of as Art Deco in the same decade. What struck me was how a figure of such influence could disappear from the historical record. Here he's included in American architecture of today by the Dean of the Faculty of Harvard University, George Edgell, uh, and he's included in a multi-page section in Masterpieces of Architecture in the United States, organized by two of Paul Cray's uh, pupils uh, and with an advisory board that included Raymond Hood and others. Uh, with the incredible submarine grill room uh, in the bottom decorated by N.C. Wyeth uh, and with that big round circle, a glass bottomed fish tank uh, on an upper outdoor deck uh, that w had uh, lights shining through it uh, at night so that the fish shadows were on the dance floor below. So this led me to challenged the standard historical narrative, arguing in my dissertation that American civilization and Europe, especially during and after World War I, were diametrically different. One was about the world of identity and individualism, while the other was rejecting the old post-feudal culture of tradition and craft in favor of an architecture that used the machine as icon rather than tool. Different cultures could not be judged by the same values. Equally troubling was the sword that decapitated the American contribution to modern architecture, Henry Russell Hitchcock's and Philip Johnson's exhibit at MoMA with the propagandist title of the international style, advocated by elite <clears throat> academics who took refuge in their superior taste. There were few examples of the style in the United States. The principal American landmark that they selected the Philadelphia Savings Fund skyscraper was nearly eliminated from the exhibit because it did not fit within their restrictive de design guidelines. Instead of being abstract, George Howe's design reflecting his training in Frank Furness's office was site specific. Its materials varied according to the separate functions, st stainless steel shop windows framed at ground level, polished dark granite cladding the bank and offices above, and gray brick and limestone clad columns for the rental office tower on its top. Its forms both reflecting the varying uses and responded to other buildings in the site. While it was largely shorn of traditional ornament, it stood out against the white abstractions of the Euro mods. And as we now know, it formed a bridge in a line of design that would remain central to Philadelphia from Frank Furness to Louis Kahn to Venturi Scott Brown. Hitchcock and Johnson's limited aesthetic palette missed the cultural focus that Sid Siegfried Gideon explored in his 1948 lectures on the origins of modern that became mechanization takes command. It was clearly intended as a reflection, as a rejection of the Hitchcock thesis. When Gideon started looking for actual sources, he found the Philadelphia region with its engineers and inventors from Oliver Evans forward. Why the Philadelphians received such short shrift has to do with the differing values of American founding cultures as outlined by David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed. In New England, settlers from East Anglia brought a culture that looked to theory and became a repository of historical investigation. The difference be between Frank Furness's Academy of Fine Arts, about which more later, and Henry Hobson Richardson's Trinity Church is told in both the design details and their construction. Furness from Philadelphia celebrated the materials and forms of the new age, 
while Boston's Richardson looked to a past in design and celebrated his avoidance of modern structural materials in his great church. As the early national center of architectural publications, New England controlled the critical narrative that valued architecture rooted in history. New York, unlike Boston, was focused more on contemporary European fashion and transatlantic culture, which provided sources for Richard Morris Hunt, McKim Mead and White and the others. Like Boston though, in the, New York has controlled the architectural narrative through his publications in the 20th century. Tellingly, critics from both city attacked Philadelphia designers who did not fit in with their historical and Beaux-Arts design. Pennsylvania was settled in the, by the Quakers and Unitarians from the English Midlands who were less doctrinaire and found their focus in the, in the physical world. In the early 19th century, after the departure of the federal government for Washington, DC, Philadelphia's focus turned toward the applied sciences with the founding of a peculiarly Philadelphia institution, the Franklin Institute for the Advancement of Science. Over the next century, the Franklin Institute would provide the leadership of the city's civic, academic, and artistic institutions and provided a remarkable clientele focused not on the past, but on the present and the future. The top innovations of the 19th century, industrial standardization, scientific management, as well as elevated wages that made every Philadelphia worker a homeowner and turned the focus of the region's artists and architects toward the present, all derive from the central role of the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. The differences between Philadelphia and Chicago interests are suggested by their clubs. Chicago is about history, music, journalism and yachts. Philadelphia, by contrast, included an engineers club, mercantile clubs, and the Franklin Institute, which was left out of this list, whose membership of 1900 members ran to 16 double columned pages in 1876. As an example of the new cultural frame of Philadelphia after the Civil War, the University of Pennsylvania's board was dominated by Franklin Institute members with scientists, doctors, and engineers predominating, while its president was mechanical engineer William Sellers, the pre premier machine toolmaker of the 19th century. The workplaces of the new board members are evidence of the industrial culture running Philadelphia. The region's leading industry, the Pennsylvania Railroad, set the industrial standards for American railroads. Unlike the New York Central, which was run by financier Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Penzi was run by engineers, men who had started in the field designing rail routes and systems, then rose through leadership. The Pennsylvania and its leaders, including such engineer partners as William Sellers, would become a, lead, a leading regional client, expanding the engineering culture across industrial America. Pennsylvania Railroad's dominance of industrial American infrastructure gave Philadelphia an enormous cultural hinterland, one that supported the spread of Philadelphia design ideas across much of the nation. When we wear Hitchcockian blinders, we miss what we should see. An example of the spread of Philadelphia design along the railroad is the near copy of Furnace's Provident Bank in A's across BB's Bank of Commerce in Kansas City. Furnace's own practice spanned from Maine to Minnesota and south to Georgia, while the Wilson brothers worked across the entire continent. The reach of Philadelphia industrialism was great as well. William Sellers was both a design consultant and material supplier for the Eads Bridge across the Mississippi River at St. Louis, a project invested in by the Pennsylvania Railroad because it enabled them to run their trains directly to St. Louis. Sellers realized that a grooved sleeve would be easier to connect than rotating a giant steel piece to thread it into another section. His idea was accepted dramatically simplifying the construction of the structure and helping him to get the contract for the metalwork of the bridge. And Sellers Edgemore Iron Company was the manufacturer of all of the structural steel for the Brooklyn Bridge. The interconnection between industry and engineers was nowhere more apparent than in Philadelphia. They led the national and international scientific institutions, owned and operated the great railroads and the specialty steel and iron manufacturers. Together, they designed Philadelphia's engineered world. With the Franklin Institute and its core heavy industries, 
Philadelphia was the center of innovation in the American industrial age, the Silicon Valley of its day. The Institute was also the center of new design theories that turned toward direct design solutions for machines and buildings. This transformation was again led by William Sellers and his cousin Coleman, the lead machine designer for the William Sellers company, who led the turn away from classical detail toward means to edge design. <clears throat> this planer won the top medals on the right at the centennial, but the British judges who viewed it as typical of advanced American design missed the key point that it actually represented the specific character of Philadelphia engineered design. Leading up to the centennial, Coleman Sellers gave a series of talks on, in, on industrial design. There, he found fitness to purpose as a type of beauty and proposed that new orders of shapes derived from purpose and materials would be the basis for the designs of the future. William Sellers' aphorism, if a machine is right, it looks right, tied machine form to function. A similar statement reappeared, of course, a generation later in Louis Sullivan's much quoted aphorism, form ever follows function, which may well have had its roots in lectures that he heard while he was in Frank Furness's office in 1873. These issues from the early 1870s set the thesis of this talk. Philadelphia design after the Civil War was shaped by the city's industrial engineering culture that rode the rails across the nation's heartland. The first true landmark of this era was Furness's commission for the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which proclaimed its art culture role in its Gothic detail and its allegiance to, allegiance to the new industrial culture in its factory-like ventilators atop the front galleries and its industrial trusses and ventilators in its attic. The design reflected the inclinations of its architects guided by his father's closest friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who you see here in the center with uh, Frank Furness's dad on the right and Sam Bradford, who will become the president or the, the vice president of the Reading Railroad on the left. Uh, <clears throat> Emerson had told Americans to turn their backs on Europe and make their art out of, out of the nature and the railroads that were the magician's rod tying the nation together. The design also reflected the new leadership of the academy, including the chairman of its building committee, not an artist, but a civil engineer and bridge designer, Fairman Rogers, as well as a committee member, Henry Morris, an iron manufacturer and electric car inventor. He's, he's riding in his electro bat uh, in the lower photograph. The plan of the building was conceived like a factory with its logistical focus on moving three audiences the public from the main street, the student entrance placed as far away as possible from the paying public, while the giant artworks and animals for the drawing class entered off a rear alley via a ground level elevator that lifted animals to the studios and artworks to the main gallery. The roofs borrowed from factories for top lighted space for close viewing and ventilation. The attic used gang ventilating systems like those in factories to draw cool air from the basement through the galleries, taking advantage of the rising column of superheated attic area, air created by, uh, the by the glass roof. The central problem of the design was how to build the masonry galleries above the glass roof that provided the optimal north light for the studios. The answer arrived at by furnace and one suspects Rogers was a giant steel truss that would span between the walls of the studios carrying the upper gallery. Because Furness and his clients intended to celebrate the industrial culture, the steel truss was exposed rather than concealed. In this factory for art, iron and steel were integral to the exterior and the interior. The industrial age had arrived and would have its own architecture. Furnace also derived the ornament of the building from industrial sources. The asymmetrical counterbalances of locomotive wheels became the ornament of the exterior iron George grills, while the drive shafts and universal joints of industrial power supply cast in bronze be became the balusters. Further, the relief ornament in the stone wainscoting was sandblasted through a rubber pattern so that even the carved stone was, was machine made. Furnace himself, reveled in the new age. 
In his banks, he used iron and glass to create top-lighted spaces that filled the long mid-block buildings with light for working. The U.S. Patent Office shows many of his inventions signed in the familiar blocky signature, including an early system for reinforced concrete and designs for interlocking rubber floor tiles that were set into mastic and used in kitchens and bathrooms in Philadelphia homes. The world was introduced to Philadelphia as the new industrial titan at the American Centennial Exhibit of 1876. The original schemes were far more architectural, more like the Vienna World Exposition, but the crash of 1873 that forced Furness to let Sullivan go from his office workforce cut the available budget in half while costing time. The Pennsylvania Railroad had invested in double and triple tracking its routes and built hotels and facilities at the fairgrounds, as well as a new terminal, all to handle the anticipated crowd. In 1874, with time running out, the railroad took over the Centennial Project, <clears throat> turning it over to their in-house engineer and designer, Joseph Wilson, and his assistant, Henry Pettit. With too little funding and less time, Wilson and Pettit turned to off-the-shelf construction units that could be assembled into giant buildings for the fair, and when the fair was over, could be disassembled and put back into the industrial supply chain. The fair would essentially rent the materials while keeping William Sellers' Edgemore iron plant in operation through the, the Depression, producing the steel tie rods and drive shafts. The engineers also applied their logistical insights from railroading to speed and reduce costs of construction, building tracks directly to the site to carry materials for the construction and later for the exhibits that could be placed directly at their final location. Instead of being a liability, it was a value to the transformation of the fair buildings toward industrial simplicity. The core message of the fair was reinforced by buildings that looked like factories. The star of the fair was the giant Corliss engine at the center of the industrial hall that powered the machines as it would have in a factory. What was not built because of the, of the depression was the 1,000 foot high observation tower with elevators in each quadrant that the Phoenix Iron Company proposed to build on the fairgrounds. The arts of the fair also had a scientific character with Thomas Aiken's Gross Clinic, named for the doctor performing the surgery, exhibited in the medical department. Henceforth in Philadelphia, science and technology would be centers of art. The modern world, especially the steam-filled train shed of Furnace's Broad Street Station, would be a subject for Philadelphia artists for the next half century. Charles Sheeler's images of the machinery of a steamship's upper deck and the wheels of a steam locomotive continued to find beauty in the world of science and engineering into his power series exemplified by the locomotive in the late 1930s. The Centennial Exposition also shaped the next round of expositions. The team that designed the Spanish Barcelona Exposition of 1888 had visited the Philadelphia Fair and chose an American Railroad Roundhouse as their building form. The interior of their fair building reprised the Philadelphia Fair exactly, even to the ventilating skylights of the roof with the giant engine as the focus at the end of its hall. The 1889 Paris Exposition with its three hinged arch, arch shed continued the industrial focus and with the Eiffel Tower, built the tower that the Philadelphia Centennial had planned but couldn't fund. In Philadelphia, these innovations were not confined to the fair. From Furnace's Academy and his skylighted steel span banks in the business district to this church in Elite Rittenhouse Square with steel flying buttresses, iron in architectural roles was everywhere. Even the interior of the exhibition hall of the Academy of Natural Science was little more than a skeleton of exposed steel and iron. In Philadelphia, iron was valued as an expression of modern life. Furnace would continue to celebrate the present with a great concourse of iron, glass, and steel for the B&O Terminal of 1886 and the giant steel girder spanned reading room of the University of Pennsylvania Library of 1887. The polite sub suburbs were not spared either. Riveted steel columns marked the porte cochere and carried the overheight ceiling of the lobby of Furnace's Bryn Mawr Hotel of 1889. In his autobiography, 
Lewis Sullivan reports that engineering nearly snared him because engineers were the only men who could face a problem squarely, who knew a problem when they saw it, while architects were frivolous persons of rule of thumb consequence. But <clears throat> his exposure to furnace, he of the flamboyant beard and yard long oaths, and the idea of the architect creating buildings out of his head instead of out of books as he phrased it, kept Sullivan on his original path toward architecture. From our perspective, Furness's influence on Sullivan is obvious in color and in sandblasted ornament like that of the academy. Tellingly, the architects and engineers took on different persona as was apparent in the appearance of Furness and Joseph Wilson. Uh, Furness on the left is the, Sullivan, or is the architect that Sullivan described. Furness in the center uh, in 1893 is still wearing uh, the big tweed jackets, the, the plaid coats, uh, and has this remarkable uh, polka dot uh, necktie uh, that uh, is set, that sets off uh, his flared collars. Uh, and then his hair is still somewhat uh, curled. I mean, it's just quite a remarkable presentation. Well, Wilson is always uh, this buttoned down uh, tight uh, figure that you see uh, on the right. This is not unlike uh, <clears throat> the uh, buildings uh, that both built uh, with Furnace's buildings at the fair, uh, very much about identity and, and uh, Wilson's very much about uh, industrial rationalism. It is to Wilson's firm that we now turn. In this, we are assisted by the firm's published catalog of work executed of 1885 that marked the firm's first decade of existence after its partners left the Pennsylvania Railroad offices. In their circular, they stated their purpose to provide a combination of engineering and architectural services in a professional manner, separate from building and contracting. The firm's org chart shows Joseph and his older brother, John, both engineers heading the practice, but working with architect Fred Thorne and other engineers, hydrologists, and designers. Joseph, like his brother John, was trained at RPI, but was further distinguished by two years of postgraduate study in the analytical chemistry laboratory of the premier consulting en engineer of his day, Frederick Genth. This training gave Wilson enormous advantages. Instead of depending on the usual rule of thumb knowledge of most engineers, Wilson understood it and could analyze the strengths and properties of steel and iron. The book continued with 27 pages between 1876 and 1885 of densely listed projects with pages on bridges of various types of materials on this page, 12 are in Mexico and inventions such as the trussel work constructed to lift and place stones for the vast Philadelphia City Hall project, or a glass and steel market in Damara, British Guiana, that was manufactured at the Sellers Edgemore plant and shipped ready to assemble. And there were interurban train stations in Philadelphia and Washington, DC, as well as dozens of suburban stations. For this talk, it is Wilson's Philadelphia Broad Street Station that is the focus of our attention. What is notable is the nearly blank south wall along a property line where if business warranted, the station would one day be expanded. In an eight story masonry wall, the depth of window openings are the same from the third to the seventh floor. Instead of the mass of masonry that would have been necessary to, to carry the 100 foot plus wall, it remained extremely thin. How was this accomplished? A column line at the point where the new wing was added tells the story where the red dotted line is. 18 years after the initial design in 1879, Wilson was part of the group brought together by the British Institution of Civil Engineers to discuss Edward Shanklin's steel construction in Chicago. Almost as an aside, Wilson remarked that he had made similar designs nearly a generation before in his building for the Pennsylvania Railroad's downtown terminal. And he noted that the thinness of the wall was made possible by being carried on steel beams resting on iron columns. You see here in the bottom of this text, uh, he'd use in the construction of Broad Street Station, 
wrought iron columns from the ground floor upward encased in masonry. Uh, and the structure, as he noted, was subdivided into a series of par parallelopipeds wrought in cast iron columns being placed at the intersection. And the interior walls and floors were carried on girders between the columns. In other words, uh, as he noted, uh, <clears throat> what Shanklin claimed as Chicago construction had appeared in Philadelphia many years earlier. Of equal interest was how Wilson's mind worked metaphorically. He saw a parallel between historic half timber construction and metal framing, with the frame carrying the load and the infill masonry merely filling in between. Uh, and th this is something he'll do over and over again. He'll see some example in the physical world and he'll say, wow, I could apply that in this way. And it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting mind. Uh, notably too, uh, this story of Wilson and his Broad, Broad Street Station Terminal uh, designed and completed as Charles Derrick says between 78 and 80 and actually I think 79 and 81 continues to be published in Philadelphia. This is, this is a story that's known uh, in the Philadelphia uh, group uh, but ignored uh, elsewhere uh, and uh, that intrigues me because it it says, as we know, that there is another history and that the sources haven't been examined. Uh, this, the, the, the Derrick story then continues with the Drexel building, which you're going to see uh, in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> Wilson had been the architect for the financial titan A.J. Drexel, designing his children's houses, later Drexel's Institute of Technology, and in 1884, Drexel's bank and offices across the street from Independence Hall. Uh, it's, most of us forget that A.J. Drexel was the senior partner uh, to uh, J.P. J. P. Morgan uh, and uh, was the principal financier uh, of the United States after the Civil War. Uh, and this bank is his Philadelphia headquarters with other offices uh, in New York. Uh, the bank was, you know, simple two-story uh, room, as you see on the right, with steel beams spanning the hall, and then with shorter beams carrying uh, what looked like brick uh, shallow arches uh, to make the building fireproof. What makes this building remarkable was what happened two years later, when Drexel purchased a lot to the rear and another one, one property away that could be combined to make a larger building. The Wilson brothers were asked to design an addition of covering the two, the two sites. They would add six stories on top of the bank and 10 stories on the rest of the site, all to be accomplished without interrupting the daily activities of the bank. The Wilson brothers solved the construction issues with an armature of steel and iron columns and giant trusses that spanned the banking room on one side and the stock exchange on the other and also served as wind bracing. The building was extensively documented in multiple consecutive issues of the 1889 engineering and building record, making it possible to see most of the structural solutions. The Monadnock building in Chicago, designed at the same time, shows the differences between the Chicago and Philadelphia designs. While we know that Jenny's home insurance was being constructed simultaneously using an early construction system, Burnham and Roots building depended on masses of stone that carried the upper stories as masonry had always done. In Philadelphia, two years later, in 1888, Frank Furness designed in addition to his earlier Provident Life and Trust Company. This was to be an office tower with steel framing and like the Wilson Brothers Drexel office building with trusses from which hung the steel girders of a clear span column first floor. Design innovations apparently moved easily around the Philadelphia center. Wilson's next imaginative design was a scheme for a new railroad station in downtown Providence. The downtown had insufficient space for a new station, so Wilson proposed building it on a bridge spanning, and this is always a tough word, the Woonasquasset Tucket River, the river that we now know because it was once covered by streets and recently has been daylighted. Uh, this didn't get built, uh, but you can see uh, Wilson's free uh, ability to conceive on a vast and extraordinary scale using the materials of his time. 
In 1891, the Wilson brothers were tasked with solving the problem of keeping two city food markets open while building a new Philadelphia and Reading terminal on the market properties. This would enable the Reading Railroad to compete with the Pennsylvania Railroad's new downtown terminal. The designers phased the construction of the new market facility above a basement cold storage at the rear of the site. Back in the back, you can see where the uh, whole train shed is complete. This is going to be the continuation, but the market's going to be back uh, in the rear. <clears throat> uh, with the overhead train shed and when the markets were open in the new location, built the new terminal down here on the front on the site of the former markets. This was followed by another extraordinary inventive scheme to build the train shed that they had always wanted for their Broad Street station as part of a monster enlargement to the station by Frank Furness. They had this, you can see the tower of the original uh, Broad Street station back here. And they had wanted to build a big arch shed because they believed that it would be less subject to the pollutants and corrosion of the steam from the railroads, but they were forced by the railroad to do uh, the low little shed there. So with uh, the furnace project, they get to do this new shed uh, and they build this on uh, a, a sort of rolling traveler formwork uh, that moves forward while keeping the original uh, train sheds underneath so that the passengers could be protect, protected while this was being constructed. One last building shows the metaphorical imagination of Wilson. In 1895, the firm designed a physician's and dentist building, the professional building, with medical office buildings on the top, on the, in the middle, and retail on the ground floor and a hall on the top floor suited for conferences and dinner. So the hall up here is for conferences. This top space is really mechanical for the returns uh, of all the plumbing. Here, recalling seeing Roman concrete construction that was lightened with terracotta amphora, which you see over here on the right, <clears throat> Wilson used terracotta pipes encased in concrete as the flooring while using uh, wind, while using steel flanges for his wind bracing. You can see this sort of minimizes. He doesn't need the big diagonals. He can uh, do lots of these smaller pieces and get the same wind bracing. My argument <clears throat> thus rests here to a central degree that is rooted in Siegfried Gideon's mechanization takes command. Innovation takes place in the real world, responding to specific needs and best takes root in places whose leadership comes from within the new culture industry in 19th century Philadelphia, or in the cases you see here of late 19th century Chicago from the logistics businesses that were transforming the cataloging and uh, mail order business. It's not a coincidence that Chicago buildings are like giant filing cabinets. Similarly, one might find the early modernism of Glasgow centered in turn of the century engineering and shipyard construction, or one could look <clears throat> to early 20th century Berlin, where chemistry and steel production fostered new design strategies emblematic of a new age. I ironically, Chicago has taken to heart the narrative of modern innovation and controls the national modern architecture story. In Philadelphia, <clears throat> Ed Bacon systematically demolished the buildings that marked the original contributions of its architects and engineers to modern construction while simultaneously smashing Frank Furness's architectural declarations of independence. Ignoring the many engineering revolutions of Philadelphia that continued up to 1945 with the construction of ENIAC, the first true digital computer, Philadelphia instead celebrates the one political revolution of 1776. The story of the origins of modern design originated in a culture that supports the new in place of the old. Philadelphia with the Furnace Emer Emerson Circle and the cluster of engineers and architects centered in, in the Pennsylvania Railroad opened a course that reaches back to the years immediately after the Civil War, yet spanned the possibilities of the future. Carl Condit, Chicago's historian of engineer, grasped Wilson's significance when he wrote that Wilson anticipated the three cardinal doctrines of modern theory, simplicity, volume rather than mass, and free-flowing space. Surprisingly, no one has followed up on Condit's praise to undertake the research 
into the remarkable insights that Wilson brought to the possibilities of construction at the end of the 19th century. Thank you.